Imagine what it'd be like if we were really curious about each other. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Relational Spirituality, the weekly podcast of LargerStory.com, the podcast that sees all relationships as spiritual and all spiritual formation as relational. Now, here's your host for this week, Roseanne Moore. Hi, Larger Story friends. We're so happy that you're here with us today. And I'm Roseanne Moore, and I have with me Carlene Cannon. Hi, Carlene. Hello. This month, we are talking about the second of the seven questions of spiritual formation. What's God up to? And for those of you who haven't already listened to it, in I think it was episode 55, Dr. Larry Crabb was developing more about the seven questions framework. And we're just going to dive into that a little bit today. Carleen, what were your thoughts about? Yeah, I think there are probably a lot of ways to answer the question, what is God up to? I think just in the beginning of this, of Larry's talk, he identifies two sort of typical ways that the spirit works in us. And I found them a little bit disturbing. Like he unsettles us and he goes after our spirit of entitlement. And I thought I would prefer a different answer to that question. That one hits a little close to home. and feels a little personal. And of course he goes and develops that a lot further in this talk. But just at the outset, I found his answer unsettling. I don't particularly enjoy being unsettled. So I would like for God to be about my good life and whatever I think that is. And I think that's what Larry was getting at. But anyway, my first reaction was not very keen. So how about you? (laughs) What struck you about the cotton? I'm I'm also reading uh, his book, A Different Kind of Happiness, and and I think partly because of the circle Christian circles that I grew up in, one thing that is sticking out to me is that God is that the gospel is good news. That was what one of the things Larry emphasized, and like you said, the things that you just mentioned don't feel like good news, right? Exactly. <laughs> but, but but if if we had that larger picture that. God is transforming us and all of creation to restore the wholeness that was destroyed by the fall or to restore the wholeness that was destroyed by the fall. Then bringing fragmentation, our fragmentation into God's presence and being honest, like letting that disruption happen, Mm -hmm. uh, being honest with myself before God, that's, that's going to be the only precursor to the wholeness that I'm longing for. Right. There's just no shortcut. (laughs) Exactly. And that's a really good follow up to what I said. And I just was struck by your words actually hit pretty close to home. There's a particular situation in my life that was incredibly disruptive. Mm -hmm. And I was deeply wounded by that disruption. And I had, and yet what in the unsettling of that disruption, I recognized how I had, in what I think was a relatively good hearted attempt to accommodate and find a way to make this situation work, but I had made certain compromises that needed to be unsettled. They weren't necessarily overtly bad, but they were keeping me from the goodness the fullness of God's goodness Mm -hmm. in this particular situation. And so still in the middle of it and it's still very disruptive and God is going after my entitlement in some ways, but there's actually a hope for greater goodness on the other side of the disruption. Yeah. That is an important and necessary part of actually surviving disruption. Yeah. Yeah. You have to know it's not just, he's going, he's not just trying to disrupt your life for power. Exactly. Or or to have his own way, like a selfish thing, like actually to bring something good like that. Otherwise you don't have any hope in it. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. And I think to my, one of the things I'm learning is that 
all my efforts to find the good path or the good situation before the disruption was never going to get me there. And that there's, I don't know that I'm going to get there on this side of it either, but there's a necessary, there, the disruption was necessary. Mm -hmm. That my definition of good wasn't anywhere close to God's definition of good. And all I could achieve pre-disruption was my substandard or actually just unreal definition of good. And God's actually wanting something more. Yeah, for sure. And, and he's wanting me to want something more too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I had a conversation with someone last week who was telling me about a book she was reading that she, it made a big deal about manifesting the life that you want, that you mm -hmm. just put it out into the universe. It was very Buddhist. Yeah. That, and it, she went on and on and she's, I just think you need to do that. And I said, it, you know, when I look at my life, mm -hmm. I think about some of the things that I really wanted. And if I'd gotten them, it would have been a disaster. Yeah. And I you know, think of your high school crush when you're 16. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> lying, right. <laughs> and, and, but I look back at the journey that I've been on and it, the, so many things in my life did not come they came through disruption. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, it was not, it was not the path I would have chosen, but I'm grateful for where it ended, where it's taken me. Yeah. It, <laughs> oh, that trust in God in the middle of things. I think, I think that's one of the things, even that in Christian community, a lot of times, one thing that Larry's books always captured was moving beyond what you're talking about of trying to do all the good things. Yeah. And instead asking, really trusting that God knows what our greatest good is. Yeah. And I think that there's something about the nature of these holy disruptions that they don't get easier. It's, it's not like I have lived enough of them and seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living on the other side of every disruption. And then I greet the next one with, wow, something great is coming for me because of this horrible disruption. Like that doesn't, you know, there's always this, I don't know, shattering, this deep disappointment, this grieving that's part of the disruption typically. And it doesn't, the journey is still hard every time. It's Again. not like it's a cycle that I get used to or better at. Yeah. Or maybe I, I get a little bit better at it because maybe I have a better understanding of what's actually happening, but it doesn't get easier. Yeah. I think what comes with time is the hope that you've been here before. And I do think there's value in knowing that if you're going to live an integrated life, if you're going to live a life of wholeness, there are just things that you have to move forward into because right. you can't stay where you are. Right. And, and so there is something that's true and it's, you just don't have to do otherwise isn't an option anymore. Whereas before right. you might've catered to it and tried to hold on to things as they were like, right. it's just not an option anymore to stay in it. Like you said, it, it's not like the things that you were trying to do weren't bad. They were just, they weren't going to get you where the Lord wanted to take you. Yeah. I think there is, as we keep walking with him, there is the history of his faithfulness and, and the knowledge that he is, there's just no other place to go. Right. <laughs> A lot of times that's what right. keeps you going. Yeah. That he alone has the words of life. And so there's no other place to go, but forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's part of when in thinking about this question of what is God up to? Like I said at the beginning, I think there's a lot of answers or nuances to the answer to that question. The Larry sort of summation of the answer to that question is he's, is he's up. What God is up to is making us like his son. And the process of that 
requires a dying to self. That's what the going after the spirit of entitlement, there's the disruption and then the spirit of entitlement. That's what that's about is the dying to self. And there's just never, death is just a hard part of our reality. And whether it's dying to the things we most want or think we want or dying to the things we believe we're entitled to or some other the actual ending of a life it's a painful process and yet it's the path to rebirth and i think there's also the element of there's simply not everything is some deaths aren't they're simply a result of living in a world that is fragmented and mm-hmm. and loss is involved and the part of that return to wholeness means grappling with how broken things are exactly and being able to acknowledge that and to feel the larry talked about the futility and detachment mm-hmm. of being able to separate from what should be and what's not right and yeah and be be willing to trust and still pursue what is good and believe that God is about pursuing what is good and true and Mm -hmm. just and beautiful, even while things are still in pieces. Right. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I found most interesting in this talk that was the first podcast of the month that where Larry walks through these different experiences, these sort of, what does he call it? From Peter Kreeft the three philosophies of life or these cycles that we go through, because I think it gives meaning to some of the randomness and just tragedy that we experience Mm -hmm. in our life. And I don't know that we always know the answers, but I think it gives us a direction to pursue as we're experiencing something really hard. Yeah, I think it, I think one gift that comes in recognize in the times when God does strip away things is it's the reminder that sin really does have consequences. Mm-hmm. It matters. It's not something that can be brushed over easily. And and so the process of grieving it and it's part of what makes us willing, I think, to align with wholeness mm-hmm. and pursue that instead of accepting the status quo, like you were saying of wanting, of wanting to avoid facing things as they are staying yeah. stuck. So I think as I look at all the different ways that God weaves things together and being patient with that and being present with him in that, there's a gift that comes in knowing that trusting that what he's doing is to bring wholeness is to bring things as they should be, not as they are, that he's not pretending, that he never pretends. I think that's one thing that now, especially as I look over the landscape of things that are happening in the church Mm -hmm. and on a large scale, I think there's a lot of disruption right now that the Lord's unveiling that people don't always accept or like they're right. but it's actually a gift it's a right. gift to expose what's happening in darkness it's a gift to uh, address things that aren't whole because yeah. um that's where he can actually bring truth and light and healing yeah but it's yeah, i think what you're getting at is that we tend or what is natural i think is to respond to these disruptions from a place of fear what am I going to lose? What's, what's, what is the badness that is coming or what is, what's at stake that's so important that's going to go wrong? Because the disruption does feel like something you need to get prepared for. You need to protect yourself against, or it, it just tends to evoke a fear response, I think. And part of what is so valuable about this seven question framework and understanding the broad scope of what God is doing and how he works is you can, like we said earlier, the disruptions don't go away. We're all going to, we're all going to experience them, but you have a meaningful 
lens through which, to, and then, and then to actually follow the spirit into what he's doing, mm-hmm. as opposed to that fear response that leads you away from what the spirit's actually doing, right? Mm-hmm. Fear and love do not occupy the same space. Perfect love casts out all fear. And so in order to follow the spirit, you can't give in to the fear response. Or at least you bring it into the presence of God. To, for- exactly. Yeah. You can't, right. Yeah. Fear is, yeah, fear doesn't go away. But I think Larry talked a lot about the choice to let fear paralyze you mm-hmm. or to actually, what you just said, bring that fear into the presence of perfect love and let love take care of the fear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because if spirit, Larry talked about how spiritual theology is the kind of theology that actually changes us, that forms yeah how we live. I think part of that is the courage to, Mm -hmm. to live an integrated life. And that means walking by faith, even when it's costly, even when it feels safer to compartmentalize. Yeah. And I think too, one factor of all of this, like of the living, the larger living Mm -hmm. with an awareness of that, the story that God's telling can always be told. Yeah. Is that when fragmentation occurs and, or when things get disrupted, when there's that sense that when you run into suffering or the stirring of that sense of futility or what, mm-hmm. that it's communal, it's not, everybody's dealing with some version of that all the time. Yeah. And we're in some phase of that all the time and everybody's making their own choices. But regardless of that, I can still choose what my response will be. And that's part of the grief though, right? Because we can't control anybody else's choices. Mm-hmm. It's not only, it's not always a, everybody's choosing well. <laughs> yeah. And that's some of the loss and yeah. some of what contributes to the disruption. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we can still, there's still hope that God's at work and that we can trust what he's doing. Yeah. Well, I think of the seasons of my life where there's been a lot of, a lot of disruption, a lot of things that, like you were talking about, where you're pursuing one thing and you think it's good and you entered it for all the right reasons And I can see in different seasons how God worked in the midst of that. And the one season, I wouldn't have my kids. Yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Without that. Yeah. Um, And I'm grateful for the things that God does, not just in us, but in our lives as well. Mm -hmm. Our our good gifts that come out of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you make a really good point or what I'm hearing and what you're saying is There's a concept that you read, especially in Paul's letters, but it comes through a lot that like in the fullness of time, God did X, Y, Z. And this idea of the fullness of time comes up a lot. And when I, for a long time, I just thought that meant that the fullness of time was a specific point in time where God decided to act a certain way. And then one one day in the middle of one of these life altering disruptions <laughs> and bypass, mm-hmm. I was reading those passages and it hit me that the important word there is fullness. There is a fullness that God is offering in a particular time. Mm-hmm. And that, yes, it is about a specific point in time, mm-hmm. but it's the fullness that he's wanting to offer or that he's choosing to offer that is, and it really is, it's a little nuanced. I'm not sure I'm articulating it well, but it really changed the way I experienced these situations. Cause like you said, something is concrete as your children, you can think about the circumstances that were painful, or you can think about the fullness of time that enabled them to be born. And then God has another thing he's doing in a different season. And that there's something very gracious and merciful and kind about God's Mm timetable. And we often experience it. It's not those things. And yet that's the reality is that God works in 
this space of fullness. Like that's what he's offering. Yeah, that's what it doesn't feel like it. Yeah, that's good. And I think that's part of the like the shortcut side is God wants to give us good things and God wants the best for us and God wants you to have an abundant life. And we fill in the blank of what that. And then you have the interim, which is true of disruption and the sense of futility and suffering and all those things. But you're pointing back to the other part of it, which if we don't have the hope of that, yeah, then it's we get lost. And that is that God is working for good. He's always right. working for good, for restoration, for redemption, yeah. for for like you said, fullness, for the fullness of his glory, which is our good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I think that's what was so interesting to me. I've heard Larry's teaching on that he borrows from Peter Kreeft, Kraft, I'm not sure how to say that, but about the Ecclesiastes experience and the Job experience and Song of Solomon experience. And you hear the teaching is not, it feels like it's not really good news. Like he wants to cycle through Ecclesiastes and Job, even for Song of Solomon. That doesn't sound like a great cycle to be a part of. And yet back to the Fullness, and I think you used a phrase earlier, stripping out the the obstacles to an abundant life. We tend to think abundant life is just a gift that gets dropped into our lap. And yet the experience described here is that there's certain things that have to be stripped away and removed. I think that's early in the talk, Larry talks about our resistance. And I think that's what we tend to resist is the process because if you as you say i think in the west in particular we're addicted to shortcuts we're addicted to efficiency we're addicted to instantaneous results Mm -hmm. and anything else almost feels like you're doing it wrong Mm -hmm. or at least you haven't figured it out you haven't figured out the right way and god operates differently some things are instant justification is instant Mm -hmm. and sanctification is not the kingdom is here like it just came to earth and yet it's still unfolding Mm -hmm. and so we live in this kind of instantaneous slow growth Mm -hmm. reality Mm -hmm. that can be hard to navigate i think yeah yeah the both and yeah of suffering and yet hope that god is at work and then is doing something good and i think i've seen enough of I've looked back in my life, I mean, I'm sure this is true for you too, of you mm. things that where you've walked into an unknown situation and you just knew you had to keep moving. You, you didn't know where you were going. You just knew right. you had to keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and to see God open the way. Yeah. And there's a level of tension with that, that we would prefer to avoid. And yet there's also a freedom and a right. peace that comes with that because yeah. because it, when it's happened before and you it's wearing but it's also it also keeps you from being imprisoned in fear. And I find it really interesting this description of these three experiences that come out of scripture that originated with Peter Kreeft Kreeft. And then Larry has taken up, and I've heard him teach on this a few different times, and it's a different take on the wisdom literature on Ecclesiastes, on Job, on Song of Songs. Uh, And what I think they're trying to say is that we experience these stories repeated in our lives. And so I'm just curious how that has impacted you. Do you align with that? Do you, is there resonance for you? What kind of experiences have you had with the Ecclesiastes experience or the Job experience or the Song of Songs experience? Yeah. Yeah. I think when I think of Ecclesiastes, the phrase under the sun keeps getting Mm -hmm. repeated. And so Mm -hmm. when I think of, and the emphasis that life under the sun can feel futile. Right. And Larry talked about detachment to from things under the sun. I think I look at it. Yes. And no, there's a detachment from needing a certain outcome now, but I think if it detaches me from giving what I can give to now, 
then mm-hmm. that's wrong. Hmm. Um, and I'm not saying Larry said that. I'm just right. saying that there's a sense in which there's a space of silence. And I want to speak to that. <laughs> when I work with a domestic violence victim and they end up being murdered, that can feel futile. Yeah. Sure. But it matters right. because not everyone that I work with has that outcome. Right. And even with that one, I have to believe, or I couldn't keep doing it. I have to believe that God sees that and that he's at work at a level that I'm not seeing the end of right now. Yeah. That he's working toward the redemption of creation and bringing his kingdom to earth and that by moving toward that, even imperfectly, even without seeing the results now, that matters to him on a relational level. That is my action in that is saying, I believe in the vision you have cast for your people and for creation. And that matters to him. That's true. If I help somebody who's homeless and it doesn't turn out well, wounds go deep. When you work with highly traumatized people, it can be really hard to end up seeing an outcome. Christians, Christian movies love to present a neat bow at the end. And life is not like that when you're dealing with people who have been deeply injured and, and living within a, a legal system where justice is elusive. And if I don't, if I just simply acknowledge the futility, I'm either going to be frustrated by it or I'm going to acknowledge it and detach so thoroughly that I separate myself. Right. Then neither of those things is going to work toward that picture that he talked about of working in every situation, like in every situation, God's at work and being able to move toward telling that story. Yeah. And the same is true with Job. I think the thing that, that I look at the most in Job is bringing his questions to God and saying, like, where are you? I don't get it. Where are you? His friends are telling him a particular narrative about what's happening. Right. Job is resisting that saying, yeah that's not the story. Is it like what's happening here? And, and God's response is in every piece of creation, I'm involved. I'm, I am engaged. I'm deeply involved when the, when the wind blows, where the snow is made, all of these things, I am deeply, intimately, personally involved. I see you. And his response to Job's friends is Job spoke about me truly. Mm -hmm. And you haven't, he needs to pray for you, <laughs> you know, right. um, and Job's response to that is a larger view of God. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to trust that, that you're bigger than what I've seen. My circumstances. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. I think you're, I think you're illuminating a really important point that could get lost in the vocabulary almost because the word detachment I think can certainly mean that I just detach and duck out of life if you will and you're right I don't think that's what Ecclesiastes is saying I don't think that's what Larry is saying or Peter craved what struck me is the phrases that that come to mind when you think Ecclesiastes vanity all is vanity and life is just striving after the wind And that's the phrase that kind of kept echoing in my mind as you were talking is the question I have to ask is, am I striving after the wind? Mm. And is that what God is detaching me from? And you were talking about the, or what I gathered in what you were saying is that we get so focused and almost addicted to the outcomes we demand. And outcomes that are good. Yeah, that we demand, but there is something just and right, like absolutely with who God is, that it is honoring who he's created us to be, to want justice, to want exactly to try. Yeah, that's right. And I'm not saying that the outcome could is it could be good, bad or neutral. It's more the attachment to the outcome, Mm -hmm. like. What God is saying to, I think, both in Ecclesiastes and in Job is you have to trust me with the process 
and the out outcome. And, and I think that's what these experiences, if you will, work out in us is the sort of still living in that tension of really caring deeply about the good outcome. I, I hear you. And I, that's one of the things I admire most about you, Roseanne, is how you jump into those kinds of situations that in spite of the p possibility for futility and the experience of it, but that God is offering us himself in the middle of the futility, the tragedy, the, the friends who are telling us the wrong thing. All of those things are opportunities to, to detach from our striving after the wind and to cling hold or cling on to the we know about God and what he's just revealed to us in that particular experience. Mm -hmm. And it does change how you experience it then. Yeah. I think. yeah. And I think part of that too is realizing that just as our response to God is individual, like it's between us and God, mm -hmm. like we also part of that letting go of outcomes mm -hmm. is realizing we can't tr transgress on another person's yeah. um, right. response to disruption. Right. Right. <laughs> um, that, and that's part of the, like, their agency in that mm -hmm. has to be honored. And it's something we wrestle with God because mm -hmm. we want him to transgress <laughs> on their agency. Yeah, <laughs> that's point. And, and yet part of the waiting and part of the hope is that he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that with us. He doesn't do that with other people. And so that leaves us only, but it's also a good thing. Like that's a freedom thing that then we stand before him and we make the choices and are responsible for our choices, not for outcomes. Right. So there's freedom in that as well, because there's too much going on in the world. That's I, I think of, I've been watching the war in Ukraine and I have people there who are telling me about it and just what it's like for them. And right. That situation is so big and there's nothing you can listen, you can pray, right. you can give, but like that day-to-day -day living thing is something that they have to navigate with God and we can't control all the choices of all the people involved. And yet somehow God is at work. And that's the hope that in the middle of this, that he's at, in that he's at work yeah. restoring brokenness restoring everything that's been destroyed by sin, that he's moving the larger, the larger creation toward a good end. And Larry talks about that, the teleos. Yeah, I think that, and I think there's both the, on the, like when Job put his hand over his mouth, like he, he, he did the whole, it's too big thing. <laughs> you you've got the, you have the big picture, but then there's also the smaller hope of, so that brings me back to just my sphere of influence that, mm -hmm. which is my choices. It's not anybody else's. Right. And there's a lot of hope and freedom in that because I get to decide whether I want to walk toward Christ or not. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. And I think that can be one of, one of the things we skirted around a little bit is how in these really difficult disruptive experiences, there's, always an element of relational pain and that could be the biggest part of the disruption but it always is part of it and it has these cascading impacts on other people and you're absolutely out of control of how that impact plays out mm -hmm. and can be one of the harder parts of the grieving and the detaching aspect of these experiences and how the trusting God in the outcome and really being able to trust what he's up to in those, in that relational fallout. I think for me, those are some of the hardest parts of these experiences is because often, quite often, relationships that really matter to me that I counted on, they're lost or they're somehow damaged or they just aren't what they were before and and they're also that's part of where the 
temptation not to trust really is the strongest, I think. Mm -hmm. And so navigating that aspect of loss is really, for me, really challenging. And I look at what Larry's saying here about being the Song of Songs experience and how it's an opportunity to draw, to draw near to God and find meaning in the story. And I believe that's true, but I find that very difficult to put into action, <laughs> to actually take in and own as I'm going through these different things. Do you think, I think one thing that can help, I don't know how this has been for you with that, but mm -hmm. being able to differentiate between the kind of disruption that God guides and recognizing not every disruption is like there are disruptions he allows and then there are right. disruptions he purposes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so not every, not everything, like you're talking about like the relational pain, not everything is something he did. Yeah, sure. And to me, there's hope in that. There's hope that, yeah. first of all, that he's not behind everything that's bad, and all, but there's still his ability to work in the middle of it. Right. Like both sides of that coin have been important to me. Yeah, and that there's something in the wrestling with that conundrum that I don't think has an easy answer. I've been thinking this whole time we're talking and I've hesitated to even mention it because I don't want this to in any way be gratuitous, but we just had this experience of, of one of my son's teammates. He plays college football and one of his teammates passed away last week, suddenly, and there's no explanation for it. Mm -hmm. And it's devastating on so many levels. And these are the kind of questions that come up when something like that happens. And there just aren't answers. Yeah. I don't, did, did God do it? Did he allow it? Does he have, like, how do you answer those questions? Why did it happen? What if there's so many questions and the, the best, I don't even know if that's the only way I know to even engage that conversation is to just talk about the character of God mm -hmm. and who he is. And these things we've been talking about, about mm -hmm. the scope of history, what he's up to. And it doesn't give a lot of answers to the pain. Like this, the spirit is the comforter. That's not my job, but... Like, those are the kind of things that I think when we, when we reach too hard and we land too quickly on an answer, we actually just cause more damage. Yeah. I don't know the answers to some of the questions my son and his friends are asking right now. And I don't know that I, I was reminded just recently, I don't, Jesus' response when Lazarus died was not to give an explanation. Exactly. Weep. <laughs> and to just be with his yeah. sisters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I it was, I'm trying to remember where I saw it, but I saw someone bring up this past week that we think we're supposed to bring the gospel. And we think that means bringing certain insider truths, but we're right. supposed to, be the gospel we're supposed to be the good news right. of what God is like and yeah so being with them in that because yeah. right we don't know there aren't answers and it doesn't right. help when I lost a baby it didn't help for people to try to get, it didn't matter whether or not they were right and I don't right. know if they were but right that wasn't helpful <laughs> right. right there are no answers in assuage that grief yeah and I think that even goes back to this whole idea of the seven questions that yes, the answers matter, but it is the questioning. It is the continually taking those questions to, to God and to his story and grappling with your understanding of those in any season, like we've talked about, mm -hmm. that is the formative part mm -hmm. of this. It's not the answers that form you per se, the answers, matter i don't think i'm communicating this well the answers certainly yeah. matter but it is the questioning that forms you yeah yeah that's true it's not the giving of answers 
or the it's the questioning that forms you because it's having God it's encountering God in the middle of the questioning right it, he doesn't really give us a lot of answers. at least that's not been my experience or these I, are not the answers I'm looking for yeah yeah I don't get explanations from him I yeah. get him in the yeah, question exactly yeah and I think that's a good Ooh. distinction I think that's really good what you just said it is if if I demand and settle for an answer I don't get him and the answer is him Mm -hmm. the only answer is him Mm -hmm. especially in a situation like I just described or situations that you've encountered in your life Mm -hmm. there are no the only answer is God Mm -hmm. and a felt experience of his presence yeah not a theological description of him (laughs) yeah and I think that but the bringing the questions like bringing the questions to the right place to him, to his presence, like that's a precursor, being honest with that. I think that's one mistake that we can make a lot of times when we, when people are wrestling with questions and we want to be quick to give an answer to reassure them, like we're actually getting in the way of them encountering God because we're shutting down their question that they really need to go to him with. And we And when we offer presence, we give the opportunity for his presence in us to meet them. But when we try to give answers instead, we short circuit that. Yeah. Back to the shortcut. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And yet our, when faced with a situation like that, there's this compulsion in me to find an answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of what Larry's getting at in this talk is to, Let go of that, to detach from that and to just accept and welcome the questioning that God has stirred up in this disruption Mm -hmm. with, and I think what makes it possible to welcome it. And I don't mean welcome in this, you know, there's no welcoming of the situation I just described. Right. So I just mean more being open to God's presence, like you said, and his movement toward you in something horrifying or just those seasons of futility or just all the things that would constitute disruption. Mm-hmm. Roseanne, as always, <laughs> I've really enjoyed our conversation. It's made me think a lot and it has stirred a lot of feelings in me and desires that are good. And it also makes me really sad because we want to let the Larger Story family know that your season here as part of the Larger Story staff is coming to an end. And I, for one, am really saddened by that. I thoroughly enjoy working with you and I absolutely enjoy our conversations. And while I intend to obviously remain friends, just the necessity of interacting on a regular basis as we work together will be something that I really miss. And we wanted to let everyone know that and then just give you an opportunity to share with us where you're at and what you're thinking and what's coming next. So I wanted to give you that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I, Larry's books have been part of my life since I was 16 years old and I'm just, I'm always going to be grateful for him for the fact that I actually got to know him and work with for him and with him and I'm so grateful for you and love you and Rachel and I've gained some wonderful friends through SSD and Next Up and the Reading and Relating Book Club the people that have just offered ongoing encouragement and spiritual companionship in my life and and I know that Larry's legacy extends through us, right? Mm -hmm. That's where, that's where God is going to continue as our lives reflect authenticity and, and curiosity. That was so big for Larry and a deep love and desire for God's glory that Larry's legacy is going to continue through that. He definitely gave off the fragrance of Christ in those ways. And I've been grateful Mm -hmm. that I've been able to to interact with his work and learn from him and all of that. Yeah. Our family has been in a lot of transition and we're still 
trusting that the Lord's going to make the path forward clear, but I'm really grateful. And yeah, we're definitely going to continue the relationship. Carlene, I would not let, let go of that friendship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For those who, who that have interacted, uh, we appreciate your prayers. Mm-hmm. The kids and I do, and my parents, we've combined households. Those of you who heard the, the story about how we joined households that we shared on the podcast a few months ago that continues. And I think coming like in this season, I just am asking the Lord to, I think this coming season, I really want to see the Lord work in our family and Mm -hmm. um, be available to him in that. And also in some, I look at my own work history and things that over time, when I became the breadwinner after being a stay at home mom and homeschooling mom for years, it was a scary step. Mm -hmm. And, and yet the Lord led piece by piece, step by step. And what's happened in the meantime, he's continued to lead forward and give opportunities. And so I don't know all of what that's going to look like, but I'm trusting that he's at each step along the way, I can see how he's built things in. And so I'm trusting that the way forward will continue to build that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Roseanne. We are, I am so grateful for just the contribution you've made here at Larger Story over the last three years in total. And then at New Way Ministries for years prior. And like I said, I'll really miss you and Larger Story will miss you and your contribution. But we want the very best for you and pray that in this new season that the disruption ha- is from God and that he then has fullness on the other side of it for you and your kids. And so I think um, that's thank one, you. Yeah. I think that's one benefit of knowing that it's, I don't want to say it's like the Red Sea. Uh, it's Red Sea hasn't opened up between you have to move forward. You know, <laughs> yes. he trusted it will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So anyway, thank you guys for joining us on the Relational Spirituality Podcast this time. And we just hope that as you move into your week, that you look for these disruptions in God's hand in what's happening, whether it's a a minor inconvenience or, or a major change. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to chatting again next time. Thank you, Roseanne. If you like what you heard today, hit the like button just below then come back by subscribing to our podcast channel. For more resources on relational spirituality, go to our website at largerstory.com.